Our white racial frame believes that the music and music theories of white persons represent the best framework for music theory. It's part of everything that we do, white racial framing in music. All of the materials that we use in our music theory classes, for sure, are so deeply indebted to whiteness. We have a very limited and monochromatic canon. Why not have a woman composer in your example from 1700? Why not have a POC if you have a Renaissance example? In the US in the 2020s, race is in. It's in the zeitgeist, especially in academia. We Americans love to have conversations about race and lots and lots of them, which is why it was no surprise when popular music theory creator Adam Neely made a video on YouTube originally entitled, Music Theory is Racist and Later Changed to Music Theory and White Supremacy. I enjoy Adam's channel, and usually he puts a lot of thought and effort into his videos. Uh, I think his line of reasoning in this video misses a few key concepts, which would add some nuance to his perspective, though. Typically, I think that if we end up with a really spicy idea, like that music theory is racist, we should probably check the reasoning used pretty carefully. The more outrageous the claim, the stronger the substantiating evidence must be. And spicy claims aren't automatically wrong, of course, but it's better to measure twice and cut once, so to speak. So with that in mind, let's talk about music theory and white supremacy. Before responding directly to Adam's video, we've got to lay out a couple of general principles that will help us see how he goes wrong. and. The first is that in any craft, there exists an interplay between form and innovation. This relationship is symbiotic because form enables innovation through faster teaching and understanding of a subject, as well as more complexity achieved more quickly and with less effort. Form can be used to gatekeep music, and there are plenty of people who do that, not only in classical music, but in any genre. This use of form can certainly be toxic to a discipline if it stifles innovation, but at its best and understood properly, form and innovation help one another. Form helps people enter into a tradition, any tradition, but in this case a musical one, and catch up on the accumulated knowledge of the discipline and its development. Innovation is a necessary part of music as each composer seeks to push music to its known boundaries and beyond. These are both in service to each other. Greater form inspires higher innovation, in turn becoming a form of its own and spurring even greater innovation. And throughout musical history, we see this dynamic in action as greater complexity is added to compositions, more instruments, more lines of harmony, more strategies of melody, longer stretches of dissonance and resolution. At the dawn of written notation in the West, for example, the manuscripts looked like unintelligible scribbles. Later, one line was added for clarity, then two, then three, then four. A certain standardized notation developed, and as modern music was born, another line was added, and the notes were made circular. This type became the form, which is used in all genres of Western and many non-Western musics to this day. Western musical notation represents a genuine innovation which has become a form on which almost every piece of musical innovation we know and love has sprung to life. This dynamic, properly understood, is unambiguously good. And through this interplay, music is able to meet its ultimate end, the beauty and enjoyment of listening. Classical music, in particular, nourishes the common human need for beauty. The better it does this, the more it resonates with the desires of the universal human heart. While subjective to some extent, beauty is transcendental, meaning it goes beyond cultural barriers to become one of the few things genuinely valued across all peoples, places, and times. 
whatever culture you belong to, something which is beautiful will be appreciated because of a person's humanity. In the words of the poet Arnold Bennett, music is a language which the soul alone understands, but which the soul can never translate. It is intimately and mysteriously connected to us, not as this or that people, but as people. Adam claims that spoken language is not universal and neither is music. Such an odd claim to make, given that if I played you this, Probably don't understand a word of it, unless you're Russian, I guess, but did you understand what Tchaikovsky was communicating? My guess is that you did, and this is because, as Tolstoy notes, music is the shorthand of emotion. And while spoken languages certainly are not universal, emotion is, and so is the beauty which evokes it. Adam tries to compartmentalize this truth that we all know intuitively by pointing out the Pythagorean theory of music. Pythagoras is widely hailed in popular culture as the father of both mathematics as well as music. Music was number in time, geometry was number in space, and astronomy was number in space and time. That makes a kind of sense, right? Or at least that's how Europeans have traditionally thought of it. Did they? Did the West only think about music like Pythagoras did? Let me ask you a question. Who are the real heavy hitters in Western philosophy? Who had the most sway from the ancient Greeks over how Westerners typically thought about the world around them? We, of course, remember Pythagoras for his ingenious theorem, and he was an influential philosopher in his own right, but it seems to me, in this case, that the far more impactful, fundamental thought in the West about music came from Plato and Aristotle. On music, Plato said... One is right in calling those of the brave man good and those of the coward bad. To avoid a tediously long disquisition, let us sum up the whole matter by saying that the postures and tunes which attach to goodness of soul or body, or to some image thereof, are universally good, while those which attach to badness are exactly the reverse. It's a little arcane, but to put it perhaps a bit more simply, music for Plato has the ability to influence character, is attached to virtue and vice, and yes, is universal, but not for a mathematical reason, for a moral reason, because it is connected to the good, the true, and the beautiful. Plato places beauty in the symposium as located in his realm of forms, participated in by anything which is beautiful, and morally determined through this unity of reality in that world. The Roman Platonist Plotinus puts it like this in his Aeneid. We hold that all loveliness in this world comes by communion in ideal form, all shapelessness whose kind admits of pattern and form, as long as it remains outside of reason and idea, is ugly and that very isolation from the divine thought. And this is the absolute ugly. And ugly is something that has not been entirely mastered by pattern, that is by reason, the matter not yielding at all points and in all respects to the ideal form. Plato's student Aristotle, while not a believer in Plato's vision of form, strictly speaking, still believes in objective beauty, although based on a more material metric of symmetry in the golden ratio. He's kind of a synthesis of Plato and Pythagoras, but 
This interplay mostly between Plato and Aristotle continued to trickle down through history from antiquity into the Middle Ages, through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, all the way to the modern age. We could talk about it for hours, but for our purposes here, the major takeaways are these three things. Number one, Adam is not representing the historical impact of Pythagorean music theory on the West accurately. He's grossly exaggerating it as though it were the only one to exist. Number two, there are different ways in which music is seen as universal, but broad agreement that it is so. And in order to refute that claim, each version would have to be answered individually, which Adam does not attempt to do in his video. And third, the more enduring school of thought is the one which links music to beauty, not to math. So when the modern poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow says, music is the universal language of mankind, it is squarely in line with a traditional understanding of beauty, the real reason the West has always held the study of music and its purpose to be, in fact, universal. But in his account from Pythagoras, Adam then immediately jumps all the way to the 1960s. There was this concentrated push in 1960s Cold War America to make the language of music theory more like a hard science and less like an art. This is all wrong when Lorenzo courts Jessica and says, a man that hath not music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds as fit for treason, stratagems, and spoils. Is that a reference to a mathematical theory? No, it's a reflection on the universal nature of music as put by a classic Western author. Are a couple of eccentric musicologists from the 60s more authoritative in Western culture than Shakespeare? Cultural expressions, of course, vary to some degree, but ultimately, there is no culture which would look at a puddle of human sewage and at a clear alpine lake and not be able to tell which is more beautiful. There is, at the very least, some degree of objectivity we are empowered to assert respecting beauty. Those who would say that beauty is a Western concept or something which can't be known by some people are bigoted and take away one of the only human experiences common to mankind. The idea actually dehumanizes non-Western cultures through the insinuation that they don't, won't, or can't possess one of the most human abilities we have, the appreciation of beauty. We can then assert with confidence that music in its end of beauty and the enjoyment of listening is truly a universal discipline wherein form and innovation represent a universal good. Adam deals with the universality of music like this. The first thing to acknowledge is that music theory has a perspective to begin with, and that is actually kind of hard to wrap your head around if you're not used to it. But he conflates two separate aspects of music theory, cultural and universal. For example, the stylings of 18th century European musicians are cultural. And by that I mean they may not be useful to a jazz or a rock musician. And Adam's criticism of the figured bass comes to mind. This should not be confused, however, with the universal aspect. There are elements of music theory, yes, created in the West, not simply limited in their utility to the stylings of 18th century European musicians. Categories of scales, vocabulary, expressing different types of harmony and rhythm, or even the notation like we talked about earlier. Any rock or jazz musician still uses these concepts in Adam's own video, when George Russell speaks about the Lydian chromatic concept, he can give words to his innovation using the notation and vocabulary given to him by the form. As Adam well knows, the Lydian mode, originating in ancient Greece, was a staple of Western musical innovation for centuries and integral to our solfege. Russell using this mode in jazz is the symbiosis of form and innovation in action, this form empowers musicians and composers to understand and control real musical concepts. And the reason we use the Western expression of these concepts is because they were developed in the West. For an example of this on YouTube, 
I recommend the channel 8-Bit Music Theory, who explains and analyzes pieces mostly from video games that we all love from our childhood, like Pokemon or Zelda, according to standard music theory. Universal Western music theory, if you really want to put it like that, but it fits like a glove, regardless of the fact that the music comes from Japan and greatly adds to our appreciation of these cool and tremendously creative composers like Junichi Masuda or Koji Kondo. If you take my recommendation and check this channel out, which you should, you'll realize that to sit there and scrutinize the analysis on the basis of racial lines is injecting a bizarre non sequitur. So when Phil Yule says, We have claimed that it is music theory, not Western, not even, not, not, not white music theory, not even Western music theory, music theory for music, kind of for the world. We should first ask, respecting what aspects? Because if the claim is that North Indian music must be analyzed and understood exclusively according to Western cultural standards, I agree, that makes no sense. But a comprehensive written language of musical expression that would actually help us to know, teach about, and understand foreign music even on its own terms. So in that sense, yes, music theory is not limited to the West, but is for the whole world. Now, when we speak about the cultural expressions, like the structure of a symphony or toccata, Adam is right that maybe you don't want to learn about the theory surrounding these to study music. There are some musical elements which are unique to that style that are not shared in other styles, which are oddly prioritized. Odd, that is. Unless you want to play piano, violin, cello, trumpet, French horn, clarinet, oboe, flute, bassoon, timpani, viola, and so on. For most people who study these instruments or sing in a chorus, they usually want to integrate into this cultural tradition of symphonic music, which started in the West and has since spread across the globe. They usually want to know how these pieces are structured and the theory behind them. The music theory, you might say, just to keep it simple. If you want it to be very technical, of course, you could take issue with this shorthand, but for most people, it's easier to just call it music theory. And while it might be interesting to take a comparative music class on the aboriginal theory of the didgeridoo, that wouldn't be as relevant to the aspirations of your typical violinist. Still, if what a student is after is an abstract view of global transcultural music theory, sure, this cultural aspect should be de-emphasized, and actually, the good points which Adam does make advocating for trimming the fat in music curricula would be helped by this distinction, leaving more room for the comparative cultural analysis he would like to see. So when Yule says, the way that they all more or less start, they talk about rhythm and meter and pitch and scale. You can begin by putting out music theory and talk about uh, Asiatic or, or uh, African or Middle East. You can talk about the Americas, South America, ideas that came from all over the planet in terms of pitch, rhythm, meter, and, and probably most importantly, scale. I agree. That sounds interesting. Note, by the way, how he still uses the terminology of Western music like meter, pitch, and scale. These universal concepts are useful, after all, even to Yule. And actually, while we're on the subject of Phil Yule. Much to my disappointment, there are still people in music theory, I wouldn't say who are white supremacist, who are white supremacist adjacent. Okay, so in Europe, through the Renaissance and beyond, there was an undeniable flourishing of art and music, not only in terms of space, but also in terms of time. As with ancient Athenian philosophy, a contribution was made at this time from these people that contributed not only to the splendor of their civilization, but to the enrichment of the human race as a whole. It is one-dimensional to perceive this achievement through the lens of ethnicity, because it only accounts for current moods and feelings while in reality, far after we are all ancient history like the Peloponnesian Wars. The artistic contribution will continue to echo similar to those of the ancient Greeks. I think about it like this. I don't care about who was right in the Peloponnesian Wars. 
It's not really relevant to my modern life, but I still love ancient Athenian philosophy. It's very rewarding to study, even for my modern life. But if I was so solidly Team Sparta that I tried to diminish and discredit Athenian philosophy, I'd be hurting myself, cutting myself off from the wisdom that they have to offer. And any Athenian who thought that the summit of the city's philosophy was in its cultural superiority to Sparta, they would likewise be selling the issue short. Neither of these people would understand the true value of the philosophy. They are too focused on the short term. Thus, seeking to weaponize a civilizational achievement for the battles of the times is wrong, and seeking to diminish it is wrong for the same reason. It takes music, something which ought to be legitimately unifying for all people, and uses it as a crude cudgel for politics, utterly separate from its true goal. It is also, for what it's worth, the exact inversion of how black American leaders originally thought of culture. W.E.B. Dubois wrote, I sit with Shakespeare, and he winces not. Across the color line, I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out of the caves of evening that swing between the strong-limbed earth and the tracery of stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius, and what soul I will, and they all graciously come with no scorn nor condescension. In Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington observes that the great human law that in the end recognizes and rewards merit is everlasting and universal. Frederick Douglass notes that a smile or a tear has no nationality, joy and sorrow speak alike to all nations, and they, above all the confusion of tongues, proclaim the brotherhood of man. Emotions, beauty, universal traits we hold in common, this broader cultural milieu of which music is a part, was held as universal by both blacks and whites historically. Ewell and Adam aren't just taking an intellectually flabby, predictable swipe at identity politics here. They aren't just capitalizing off of the racial anxiety that exists in the States, although they are certainly doing both of those things. More importantly, they're attacking a revered cultural consensus of blacks and whites and all other peoples that has been known so well for so long, it hasn't even seemed to need defending for decades. It went without saying. I think that's really at the heart of why racializing music provokes such a strong reaction in people. Yule states that. We've only seen music from this angle, and it's been a white angle, and it's been a male angle, and together, not or, but white and male. But what does that even mean? That the authors we focus on were white? Were their views white? What's a white view? What's a male angle on music? Let's conduct an experiment. Beautiful, right? Is this male music? Well, I guess if you mean that it was composed by Autorino Respighi, is it white music? I guess if Italians count as white, Respighi wrote in the first half of the 20th century, so I suppose he's on the fence. But if you're a fan of European history, you might realize that an Italian in the first half of the 20th century would have had some familiarity with fascism. And while never outwardly fascist himself, Respighi was friends with fascists and a member of the fascist Reale Academia d'Italia. So, 
I guess we shouldn't listen to Ancient Airs and Dances Suite Number 3 again. Gotta be on the safe side, right? Does this make any sense to you? According to this logic, maybe it would have been better for you if I had never told you. Then you could have enjoyed this little suite in peace. Hear no evil type of deal. No. That's obviously ridiculous, and this is perhaps the most severe mistake Adam makes in all of his analysis. Disciplines, after all, are ordered towards discrete purposes. Music is ordered towards beauty and the enjoyment of listening. I don't particularly agree with Lin-Manuel Miranda, but he's a good composer, and so it doesn't bother me to listen to his music and implies no tacit approval of his politics. I'm just enjoying the beauty of the music. I can disagree with Miranda about economics, the discrete end of which is the generation of wealth, about history, the discrete end of which is knowing the truth about the past, or politics, the discrete end of which is the flourishing of a community. And yet, I can still listen approvingly to the beauty of his music. Which brings me to Adam's criticism of music theorist Heinrich Schenker and the fact that Schenkerian analysis is used in music schools to this day. Carl Schachter, the guy who co-wrote this Harmony textbook that we keep referencing, wrote that for Schenker, both his political and musical ideas were armaments in a cultural struggle that would eventually lead to a regeneration of both music and society at large in the German-speaking world. Do you recognize the distinction Schenker fails to make? He linked music to a racial theory popular at the time in order to use music as a tool for his racial political goals. Being a musician, like many musicians, he was fairly vulnerable to being swept up in the zeitgeist of his times, and so he came to many conclusions linking music to race. He fell victim to the intellectual fashions. And, of course, the vast, vast majority of people who study Shankarian analysis don't care very much about his philosophy. They more so care about his music theory. Adam himself says... The music theory of Henrik Schenker also might be very useful in understanding the music of Bach and Mozart and Beethoven, and honestly, the musical notation looks freaking sweet. sweet. That doesn't mean that his worldview has to be the default. Adam, like most people, is able to appreciate Schenker here because he intuitively makes the separation between discrete ends of disciplines. He just needs to apply it consistently. Schenker and Adam, in general, fail to make the same distinctions between music and politics. Adam fails in the exact same way Schenker did, in the exact same breath in which he criticizes him. Adam and Schenker are both wrong for the same reason. The discrete end of music is the universal goal of beauty and the enjoyment of listening, not race politics. People who want to believe in race neutrality, they want to believe in a colorblind society. Why do you always have to make it about race? Stop talking about race so much. It's not about race, it's just about good music. There's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. <sighs> yes, what your thoughts may be on race politics is irrelevant, believe in a colorblind society or not. It has nothing to do with the excellence of this discipline. That's politics. This is music. The bottom line is, whoever is peddling it, Adam Neely or Heinrich Schenker, the racialization of this study of music does all of us a disservice. Through music, the human condition is made better and the common human burden is made lighter. Through the musical achievements of the West, the human condition is made better, and the common human burden is made lighter. Dismissing or diminishing any music of beauty misses the point of music itself. We listen and enjoy, regardless of race, sex, or yes, even political belief, insofar as music exists in service to beauty, it exists in service to all mankind. We share this experience because we are all human. 
And I think that's what jazz musician Roy Ayers meant when he said, the true beauty of music is that it connects people. <laughs>